recording. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here and thanks for being uh, early uh, on time, especially to Mahajabeen, who is joining from Pakistan at 5 a.m. and has been awake since th uh, 3 a.m. So really kudos to her for being uh, a part of this panel and helping to organize this really amazing panel. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I am Radhika Anger at the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University at the Earth Institute. And this is a series that we've run on hearing student voices on centering SDG. So it's student run panel and they have come up with the ideas and they are discussing what is really important uh, for them and how do we integrate the sustainable development goals into education. So today we have uh, panelists who will be discussing building disaster preparedness and risk reduction skills in youth, such a, such a current topic and so relevant. And then urban challenges, uh, reimagining our urban spaces. Again, very pertinent to uh, our cities, very pertinent to how we want to reshape and rethink spaces. So I'll just head over to Majaveen and Sue uh, to, to lead this discussion. Thank you. Just a quick correction, um, Radhika. It'll be Yoon Song and Maj to be leading the panel, and I'm actually just going to be sitting back. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Radhika. Um, so, I, I, because we wanted to keep it very, very authentic to to youth, so Yoon Sung Kim uh, will be um, uh, will be leading. Um, the, the panel. So over to you, Yoon. Even better. I love this. Thanks, Yoon, for uh, moderating the panel today. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Yoon Sung, a current freshman studying development at Cornell. Uh, I have the privilege of introducing the upcoming panel on the critical issue of disaster preparedness in youth. So as climate change and political disagreements ricochet around the world, displacing millions of civilians, children in particular, have been hit the hardest. Not only are their lives at stake when disaster strikes their cities and towns, but their future is highly contested with questions remaining unanswered. So this has reinforced the importance of building disaster preparedness and risk reduction skills within the youth as political and environmental instabilities continue to test their resolve around the world. According to the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, children are increasingly perceptive of the threat of climate related disasters and the salient mental health issues that arise as a result. Readers report the disasters both in terms of violence and climate not only pose adverse impacts on their education and social growth, but also places children at higher risks of sexual violence, indicating the critical importance of educating youth on disaster preparedness and how to respond if disaster enters their lives. So a report by the United States Federal Emergency Management Agency relayed the importance of constant communication with authorities via an app, along with the preparation of disaster preparedness kits that will last a minimum of 10 days. Additional notes by the agency report the importance of vaccinations against all possible infections due to the prevalence of illness during disasters. And in a recent paper published by Dr. Manesh in the NIH National Library of Medicine Journal, she emphasizes the importance of, importance of grassroots education and to provide engaged learning opportunities for youth in disaster preparedness, specifically in programs tailored to both formal and informal education while accounting for different age groups. The panel today therefore aims to tackle this pertinent issue by highlighting the five panelists in the areas of sustainability, emergency preparedness, disaster, risk reduction, and urban planning. You will hear multiple perspectives as the panelists talk about sustainability through disaster management, urban planning, tackling food insecurity, and more. The central idea is that youth can and are playing a role in guiding the way we think about and enact sustainable solutions. On that note, I'd like to welcome the first speaker, Eugene Yu. All right, hello everyone. My name is Eugene Yu. I am from Stuyvesant High School. And today I'm gonna to be talking about educating the youth about disaster preparedness, specifically in schools. And this is a really important issue in today's day and age due to climate change and also the rise in, that, um, in disasters, whether those be natural or technological. And so the first question is why should we care about youth and disaster preparedness? So youth are a particularly vulnerable group especially in schools because they aren't close to their families. And so um, it's really important to do more to 
better prepare youth specifically in schools. Um, in addition, a lot of youth will experience the effects of current policies in the future. So because of this, they should be actively participating and contributing to ideas and discussion right now. In addition, a lot of youth in today's day and age are technologically savvy and entrepreneur oriented. And so because of these reasons, they're willing, they're motivated and they're willing to make an impact right now. So one way to involve youth immediately is to put them in organizations. So for example, there's the young NGOs program started by the United Nations. There's also FEMA and there's also the Philippines Youth Councils, which is a slightly smaller program, but it serves to increase youth awareness about disaster preparedness, specifically in the Philippines. So um, one major way to address the problem of disaster preparedness, particularly in youth, is through education in schools. And this is a very advantageous solution, particularly because it increases the scope of accessibility. Um, so for this reason, and because of how vulnerable schools are, disaster preparedness education and curriculum should start early on, um, desirably in elementary schools. One huge benefit of creating education programs in schools specifically is that for universities, there will be medical schools which can help take the lead for these programs. And for non-universities, there are gonna be nursing departments, maybe psychologists who can further aid with disaster preparedness. Additionally, a lot of schools contain engineer-oriented students. And so by educating these students early on about the importance of disaster preparedness, specifically in schools, they'll hopefully be able to design certain structures in the future that take more consideration into this in the future. Additionally, a benefit of educating in schools is that this is a fairly universal process. It doesn't matter how developed or wealthy a country is, they should still be able to participate in this program and educate their youth about disaster preparedness. Additionally, one benefit of education within schools is that we're indirectly reaching a much greater group of people because the youth um, will be able to spread the, the policies and ideas that they learn in schools to their families. And in the case of a natural disaster at home, they'll be able to lead the, the way to recovery. So one example I wanna quickly talk about is the Philippines. The Philippines has over 7,640 islands and it also has a large amount of its inhabitants using technology, specifically smartphones. So because of this, one solution to increase education awareness about disaster preparedness has been to create a mobile-based game that has multiple stages and that serves to um, educate more about disaster preparedness. This is a really advantageous solution because it serves as a teaching resource for schools, but it can also be used um, at a more macro level for non um, for, for students who are not in schools as well. Another example is with Japan. So an interesting about, thing about Japan and Indonesia is that they both su suffer from similar natural disasters, namely earthquakes and tsunamis. And so because of this reason, they decided to create a multilingual educational platform that um, helps educate youth more about disaster preparedness. And this, tech, this resource has been extremely effect, effective, which you can see in the Takura Elementary School, for example. After um, a 2011 tsunami hit the school, the school was still able to um, recover and there were no fatalities reported, which is, really remarkable given the fact that the school was practically completely destroyed. Another example of disaster preparedness education is with Australia. And so one of the unique things about Australia is that it suffers from a lot of bushfires. In response to this, it's been increasing its, its distribution and awareness of various different teaching resources. So for example, there's the Principal's Guide to Bushfire, there's the New Zealand Education Gazette, and there's also the Disaster Resilience Education for Schools. And these are all teaching resources that have been spread throughout Australia, and they've made a significant impact as well, which we can see by how well Australia was able to respond um, during the 2011 earthquake following the 2010 Canterbury earthquake. So 
One problem about natural disasters is that some of them are inevitable. And so it's important to be just as, it's, it's just as important to prevent them as it is to be able to respond to them. And so one solution to that is to increase state and federal collaboration. But more importantly, it's important to get children and young people back into schools. And it's also important to take into consideration the staff's point of view as they may be struggling to recover from natural disasters, just as students are as well. So one study um, recommended five core values to, to prioritize when responding to a natural disaster. And these are a sense of safety and security, self-worth, social connection, self-efficacy, and a sense of purpose. So Japan had a particularly great response to the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. For example, in, in Fukushima, there were over 36 programs that covered various different um, forms, such as music, drama, literature, arts, and film. And New Zealand also responded well to its earthquake by um, placing an emphasis on the well being of children and also incorporating multiple child friendly spaces. So, in summary, um, there are definitely many things that we can do to better prepare for uh, the future, specifically with, with regards to disaster preparedness. Um, of course, increasing engagement with youth through student organizations is a great alternative, but more importantly, it's important to be able to educate students within school specifically, which has an additional effect of protecting um, their families as well. Um, at the same time, on, if a natural disaster is to occur, it's important to be accommodating and understanding. One possible limitation with disaster preparedness education is that it can be difficult to design and construct a great curriculum. And so it, it requires a little bit of um, small investment at the beginning, but it will be very beneficial in the long run. Thank you so much for watching and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for your presentation on disaster disaster preparedness, specifically within the variety of different countries. And now for our next speaker, uh, Chris will talk about his work on disaster preparedness, specifically through curriculum within different high schools. Okay, can everyone see the slide? Yep, all right. All right, hello everyone. My name is Chris Jong. And today I'll present my stance on disaster readiness. All right. When we hear disaster readiness, we automatically associate events such as the typhoons of Japan, the forest fires in California, or the devastating hurricanes that form in the Atlantic and Pacific oceans. We visualize the mass destruction these incidents establish from destroyed buildings to dismantled roads. And in terms of preparedness, we think of building safe shelters, gathering supplies, and creating a safety plan. However, something often neglected with the pop preparedness of disasters is food security. Although creating shelters, gathering supplies, and making safety plans are extremely important and required to prepare for disaster, having a sustainable food supply after disaster is also imperative. Food insecurity is defined as the state in which one cannot receive a stable supply of nutritious food. According to the World Health Organization, a shocking 30% of the global population or 2.3 billion people do not have access to a year round supply of food. In order to picture this image, imagine a classroom where there are 10 children and three of them have not eaten a meal in several days. Now imagine 230 million of those classrooms. Food insecurity is a humongous issue, glo issue globally. And as the population continues to increase with the limited amount of land, the lack of food for everyone is bound to happen. Food supply is also affected by climate change. This is because climate change can disrupt farm, farms and food suppliers. One big reason why climate change can affect farms is because of the sensitive nature of crops. The success of crops is heavily based on climate where certain crops uh, need perfect circumstances in order to succeed. Too many cold, hot, dry, or humid days can cause an entire crop season to be ruined. And in developing countries where they are heavily dependent on their own supply of food, this can cause millions to starve. Uh, one example of a nation suffering from the effects of a disaster and climate change is Haiti. On August 14th 
2021, Haiti sustained the deadliest earthquake since 2010 and the deadliest natural disaster of 2021. The earthquake had reported a 7.0 magnitude and was catastrophic for this developing nation. This earthquake displaced thousands and destroyed shops and roads. This and made it nearly impossible to receive food from the locals. The main source of food had to come from supporting nations that were willing to donate food. Haiti had to deal with rebuilding their country as well as funding their main source of income, agriculture, which posed a big budget issue and led to many Haitian residents starving. Haiti also suffered big hits to its farming industry because of climate change. It has been reported that climate change has led to an overall less uh, crop yield. And it also doesn't help that this country has an ineffective and outdating farming technique and technologies. Haiti is in dire need of a disaster readiness plan, one that outlines a passage of safety, but also that provides a sustainable uh, food supply. So those who survived the disaster don't have to worry about dying from starvation later on. A disaster plan keeps citizens safe from earthquakes, but also keeps them well nourished. Not only Haiti, but even the US needs an effective plan for food security. 38 million Americans suffer from food insecurity. Better farming techniques need to be mandated and uh, legislation on carbon emissions need to be implemented in order, to, um, in order for farming systems to prosper. Food security needs to be preached in public schools as well. In this way, children and adolescents take what they've learned of climate change and food insecurity into their adulthood. These students will become the future of the United States and they can vote for eco-friendly representatives and support legislation that helps with the prevention of climate change. For people to be educated on the horrifying statistics of the future to come, um, would want them to want to take action now. I have created lesson plans that are fit for high school students to learn about food security and how climate change affects it. This slide shows one of the many lessons I've created that makes students learn of the detrimental effects of continue the world as it is and how food security is a global issue. It utilizes resources such as the Age of Sustainable Development by Jeffrey Sachs. In this plan, I focused on students working in groups to present to the entire school a TED talk that would educate the student body on what they've learned in the class. Students must learn about climate change and food insecurity. In the future where the world can starve, it is paramount to educate future generations to revert the detrimental effects past generations have afflicted. Food insecurity is one of the biggest issues we face, and it is our responsibility to educate the future of this world. When looking at disasters, we often think of natural disasters, but often forgotten about is food insecurity. Food insecurity is exacerbated by disaster by these disasters and can cause mass shortages of food. My proposed solution is to educate the world of these issues using material, material available to today's educators. My lesson plans are available online and I'm happy to share them with teachers uh, who want to help, uh, teach about food insecurity. We must prepare for the biggest disaster our world has ever faced, climate change. And that starts with educating our children. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for your extensive presentation, specifically within schools and your detailed lesson plan. On that note, we'd like to welcome our third speaker, William, who will share his preliminary findings on a comparison on the preservation of landmarks in South Korea and New York regarding climate change and disaster preparedness. Uh, is everybody able to see the, that's not the right button, slide? Hello everyone, my name is William Moon and I am currently a 10th grader at Phillips Academy Andover and I'm here to present disaster preparedness on landmarks in South Korea and New York regarding climate change. Okay. So as a young man, I realized that climate change is impacting every facet of our life. Every way we live is being affected by climate change and national monuments are no exception just because uh, their landmarks and architecture. Climate change can heavily affect these landmarks and architecture through rain and hurricanes and rising sea level and other various factors. So what I will do today is to present what plans are already in place to protect these places in the current moment. What New York and South Korea have planned to preserve their, uh, the Statue of Liberty and Jeju Island and the depth of their plan to see if there can be more things done to protect these monuments in the upcoming future. Basically, just some basic facts about the Statue of Liberty, like everybody knows, is that the Statue of Liberty was gifted by France as a sign of friendship, and it is now recognized globally 
as the symbol of freedom and justice. And the Statue of Liberty is probably one of the most recognized landmarks in the world as it has around 10,000 daily visitors and had 4.5 million visitors in, in, the, in the year of 2017. In comparison, Jeju Island is the biggest island in South Korea. It is a huge tourist destination as it has around 150,000 visitors every year that are not only from South Korea, but also a bunch of other countries. Jeju Island has also been selected as one of the new seven wonders of nature in the world, which was an initiative that was started in 2007 to create a list of seven natural wonders through an internet poll chosen by people. The poll ended with having over 100 million votes and Jeju Island did come out on top and was selected to be one of the, uh, to be a part of one of the new seven uh, wonders of nature in the world. And one of the biggest reasons why people or that Koreans go to Jeju is for their amazing diving experience because it's basically the only place where people is uh, people are able to dive in Korea. And both of these places are huge tourist destinations in their own respect with their own pros and cons. But something that they both share is that they are both really susceptible to climate change and natural disasters. So some effects on of climate change on both of these places is that uh, for the Statue of Liberty, the rising sea levels due to climate change can possibly sink some parts of Liberty Island in the future. Another big problem with the Statue of Liberty is that some of their construction is not compliant as they are not fire resistant and can easily weather when raining or going through a storm. Similarly, Jeju Island also have their own struggles with climate change. Just like the Statue of Liberty, rising sea levels in Jeju Island can possibly sink some parts of the island. Not only that the natural fish that divers would usually see in the area are starting to disappear due to the increase in temperature because of climate change. And, uh, and temperature or weather being one of the biggest attribute and pros about Jeju Island is also getting ruined as the temperature is increasing over time and their weather is uh, drastically changing. And in order to prevent these happenings, we have to start planning for the future so that future generations are able to witness these uh, historical landmarks that have so much history behind them. So some emergency plans that I have found that are already in place are for the Statue of Liberty, the National Park Service, which is the organization taking care of the Statue of Liberty, is planning to increase the electrical system by 20 feet above sea level to combat against sea, uh, rising sea levels. They're also designing a heating and air conditioning system in order to combat against weather and temperature problems. And as for Jeju Island, they're trying to aim to be carbon neutral by the uh, year 2030 to try and slow down global warming as much as possible. However, when going through the research, I was unable to find too much information regarding the plans South Korea had set when a disaster were to happen in Jeju Island. Not only did I try and find them in English, I also tried searching them up in Korean and there were close to uh, no information about them. This is a huge problem as if this, if, if it is hard for me to find like disaster preparedness plans about Jeju Island in both Korean and English, if a disaster were to happen, people would start panicking because they just wouldn't have the knowledge of knowing what they need to do to try and help the situation out. This is also slightly true for the Statue of Liberty as I did not find much information, but I definitely did find a lot more than Jeju Island. And something about Jeju is, let's say, uh, if we go into detail for Jeju Island, because Jeju Island is such a big place, I found a monument with a historical significance called Tepohean Jusang Jolli Cliff uh, in Jeju Island. And this cliff in Jeju was formed by the Halasan volcano in Jeju erupting a long time ago. And as this cliff lies along the southern coastline, it is very susceptible to rising sea levels. The jagged shapes of the rocks, as you can see in the picture on the right, of this place makes it such a spectacular view when actually going as if you're a tourist. But as you can see, if the sea levels were to rise a little, we can see that some of the rocks near the bottom have a chance of sinking and basically become not visible to tourists later on. And something that is very special about this is that since this is a natural monument and natural monuments usually uh, have the risk of something like this happening to them because we as humans did not create them. We don't have as much control as they come in all kinds of shapes and forms. So in any case uh, of a disaster, we have to be very open-minded in trying to deal with these places. So we're able to preserve their 
inherent natural nature of them, unlike something like the Statue of Liberty, where it is because it is man-made where we can change a lot of the stuff. And so what can we do? Basically, so far, most of the plans are very technical as they're heavily based on the government uh, doing something. So it's actually really hard for the average youth slash human being to actually make a big impact on the situation. But when thinking about protecting our monuments during a time of disaster, we need to know what we need to do. So information regarding disaster preparedness needs to be accessible to everyone easily and need to be easily understood to everyone. And this is the problem. Uh, when I was trying to search these up, like I said before, it was really hard to find these uh, plans so that in an actual case of a disaster, most people will probably have no clue what they're actually supposed to do leading to a catastrophe. And I think a great way they can implement this is like uh, teaching them at school, because I think school is a great place to educate young people about if, if the, uh, some of the plans, if they do have them. However, currently most plans are not really in place and the plans that are in place are not very clear and inaccessible to the mass public right now, which requires immediate fixing. So we as people know what to do when in a case of a disaster. Thank you for listening. Thank you, William, for your presentation. I, especially regarding the landmarks and how important it was to educate individuals to, and also the technical details of preserving these important landmarks. But on that note, we'd like to welcome the fourth speaker, where Cherry Chung will talk about her research on the role of urban design of public spaces and their utility in emergencies, especially during the current COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Um, all right. So my name is Sherry Chong and I'm presenting on public libraries, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic and disaster preparedness. Um, so during COVID, I had to write a term paper project where we had to branch out, do some research and that was when I realized that I would have loved to have much better access to a public library because it was so difficult. And so with my interest in design, I wanted to look at and better understand how we can help public spaces be accessible and also operate safely during pandemics and other emergency situations. All right. So first of all, it is important to note that the COVID-19 pandemic is the first one that we are seeing happening in the digital age. So my presentation will be talking, taking in technological advancements like the internet to show how public libraries can still be public spaces. A general trend is that there has been a continuation or perhaps even an acceleration in digitizing public libraries and their functions by, for example, utilizing social media to spread library or local news, or having a digital library or catalog that shows available books or DVDs. However, this brings up the problem of accessibility to the internet to reach these online sources, especially in low-income areas. Um, so what have some specific libraries been doing during the pandemic? A great example is the Vallabhattanam General Public Library in Kerala, India. The VGPL offered door delivery service of books to safely allow for people to borrow and read during the pandemic without having to spend money buying. The VGPL also utilized social media platforms like Facebook and YouTube to share information on the coronavirus, its preventative measures, and any updates on the library itself. They also kept a series of computers that followed COVID protocols, meaning they were socially distanced and sanitized at regular intervals. In Wuhan, China, library workers set up book corners in temporary hospitals for medical staff and patients, so small areas where people can come in, take a book, and read and relax. Other libraries in China and around the world have also helped, helped donate materials, such as sanitizing and protective equipment during the pandemic for medical staff. So when thinking about future pandemics and possible interventions, one is a containment space, which is a buffer area between the outside and the inside world. An example of this is the Villa Savoy by Le, Le, Corbusier, Le, Le Corbusier, 
um, where he installed a sink at the entrance hallway of the villa um, where people could walk in, wash their hands, and then continue to do whatever they want to do inside the house. And although this convention was not well adopted, it offers a reconsideration of the purpose of rooms and appliances and the idea of movement through space. And when thinking about pandemic, it would be helpful to, for safety and sanitation for visitors of a public library to minimize possible spread of bacteria and the virus. Another is a pickup or drop off station for visitors who want to borrow books and place towards the entrance of a library where people can, if they want to just quickly drop in, take a book, borrow a book, drop it off. Um, it's similar to the concept of food pickups or Amazon lockers, which, and this intervention would reduce the quantity of people that are in contact and the time they spend in contact with each other. Another intervention is dividers to section off areas of in the library to be smaller, more private, maybe fitting one, two, or three people. Um, one example are flexible foldable wall dividers that you see on the left. And another more long-term solution is an installation of a divider across the ceiling that we typically see in school gymnasiums. Um, and lastly, we have an increased access to outdoor spaces and airflow. One example of this is the Kengo Kuma and Associates design of a community library in Yusuhara, Japan. Um, and with this research, I plan to follow up on this project, hopefully with the design of an urban public library, thinking about disaster preparedness and re-envisioning existing services like Amazon lockers in ways that can be used to minimize the effect of the pandemic or any similar emergency, but also keep public libraries in the center of the community that they are in. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation on the urban design and how it could help contribute to people during emergencies, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, on that note, we'd like to present our last speaker, Ace, who will present on the sustainable and affordable housing options for young couples in South Korea. Uh, hello, my name is Ace, and I am a sophomore in Seoul Foreign School in South Korea. And today I will be sharing to you affordable housing um, uh, with more regards to um, this current situations in Korea and how um, it affects the global um, relations um, around the world. So to, uh, for this presentation, I will try to answer to what extent is affordable housing a, a major concern. So affordable housing refers to housing units that are affordable by the section of society whose income is below the median household income. Through different, uh, though different countries have different definitions for affordable housing, it is largely the same. Um, affordable housing should address the housing needs for the lower or middle income households, especially in developing nations where a majority of the population isn't able to buy houses at the market price. So affordable housing and sustainable urban development are uh, major concerns and challenges across the world, including Korea. Generally, there is a conflict between the approach of sustainable development and affordable housing. Sustainable development means compact cities and often compact development is more, um, it's usually more expensive than the low density residential uh, development in um, outskirts of cities. Uh, sustainable housing options are um, not only environmentally uh, good for um, some reasons, but they can also be very social and cultural reasons too. So let's take the case of Korea. The Korean Times reported in uh, 2021 that housing prices in Korea have increased by nearly 20% since January of 2020. And a house can cost more than 10 times the average annual household income. The problem is even more acute in Seoul uh, metropolitan areas uh, with housing prices uh, rising by almost 25% in the same period, far outpacing many Asian metro um, policies such as Beijing, Hong Kong, and Singapore. The Asian Development Bank also forecasts that with the rate of economical growth, um, it's, uh, it's currently slowing down and the income distribution is becoming more concentrated. The total fertility rate is declining and the population is aging rapidly. In addition, the, uh, the housing policy needs to consider its linkages with the, uh, the wider economy and the environmental sustainability. 
Of these concerns, a particular one, um, housing for young families or young people wanting to settle down and raise a family has um, taken center stage. But how does that measure? Uh, real estate prices have steadily risen since um, Moon Jae-in, uh, the South Korean president, uh, he, when he took office in 2017, a trend that has made purchasing a starter home less viable for the regular South Korean. Um, the governmental approach um, to tackle the housing problem, which essentially concerns the starting point for young newlywed couples. The city of South Korea in Seoul has rolled up its sleeves and um, launched housing programs that will support 25,000 couples each year. These, this means that um, one in two couples are getting married in Seoul each year, and they will all be able to receive benefits from the city uh, in the form of financial aid or uh, place in public rental house. And any couple who does not own a house and um, earns a combined income of less than uh, 100 million Korean won will be eligible for participation in these programs. The financial will aid will also be uh, available to common law marriage. Uh, while there are affordable housing options for young couples, um, there are long waiting lists and double income households where both husbands and wife uh, hold full-time jobs might not necessarily qualify. Because low income households um, have been central to Korean infrastructure policy, the, the young married section of society who uh, might not be in, on low income yet still uh, cannot afford to purchase a house in Seoul, the largest city in the, in the capital of Korea. The South Korean government offers affordable housing to young couples, but waiting lists are long. Instead, um, instead some to be eligible, some South Korean couples hold off on registering their marriages for years to avoid high, high um, housing prices. Um, it is often thought that um, sustainable housing is focused more on environmentally friendliness and um, of the housing structures, but equally important to sustainability are the values of fairness reduction of inequality, equal opportunity for all, regardless of wealth. The shortage of economical housing in South, uh, in South Korea, Seoul, has caused young families to make, it dif uh, to make difficult choices in their personal lives, such as deciding when to marry or start families. While new housing is being built and the government is also trying its best, the implications of sustain sustainable, unsustainable housing, such as major developments in the uh, only rich districts, has meant that uh, the aspiration to own a home of their own is no longer possible for many in the country. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for your presentation, detailed presentation on the urban, urban issues as well as like affordable housing for young couples in South Korea. And I'd like to thank all the speakers again for their insightful presentations ranging from urban planning to landmark preservation to food security. And I think it showed the detailed insights and perspectives that every student has towards addressing this issue. And I'd like to also thank Director Radica for making this panel possible. Again, and I'd like to thank all the panelists again for their insightful presentations, as well as Maja Bin and Sue for also making this panel possible. Thank you. So I think that would cap off the panel for today regarding the youth uh, responding to disaster preparedness within the youth. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think this was such a fascinating panel and thanks for moderating it so well and keeping it on time. Uh, just, I'm just awestruck by the, your amazing uh, presentations and the details that you have put. I got to learn a lot of new things and your literature review in many cases was so exhaustive. I'm just so impressed on how you were able to gather all this information uh, just my question, maybe a couple of you can answer, how did you come up with the topic and uh, are you interested in the disaster relief or disaster preparedness side or do you think that, uh, you know, you are more interested in maybe the architectural side like the libraries or maybe the education side in terms of what schools should be doing. So overall, what is your sense and are you hopeful that we will through education uh, make a dent in uh, disaster preparedness in the schools and if there is anything that is currently going on in your schools uh, apart from this panel and apart from all your amazing work that you've been able to do is there any disaster preparedness going currently going on in your uh, schools i would eager i would be eager to uh, know about that lots of questions but you can pick and choose and see what you want to answer
Yes, Jerry. I can start. Um, so I like mentioned this before, but I came up with my presentation because um, of an idea that came up during after like I had to do a term paper project for my school and research was something that I found difficult. And so I thought of public libraries. Um, and I think with this project, I entered more with, um, I guess the purpose of with my interest in design and architecture. But I think through this project, it really sparked an interest in urban planning and design for cities um, and like towns, I guess. Um, and thinking about how um, like public spaces can be structured in a way to help even more people um, around the community. And for something related to my school, I'm not too sure about disaster preparedness, but I do know that um, my school tries to help as much as they can with drives um, for people in other places and with other organizations. So that's just something that I do know about myself. Great. Thank you so much for your answer. Yes, would you? Sure. I can talk about my interests. Um, I'm I'm involved in a bunch of different organizations that I've I've started as a high school student. So like for for example, there's this chamber music organization that I created. And the idea is to promote chamber music in various different middle schools. And one problem that I saw with this was that I was only able to reach a certain number of students. And so having like a more universalized education program would be able to greatly impact the scope of whatever topic that is. And so when I thought about that with, with specific regards to disaster preparedness, I thought that if you were able to in integrate that into an academic system, for example, that would um, lead to huge changes and a completely different mindset to climate change and pollution. Um, so, yeah, and then in terms of my school and what we've been doing, for example, with the U recent like Ukraine crisis, for example, a couple of students at my school have been fundraising and um, receive, receiving donations from a bunch of different students. And then they've been working with a bunch of different Ukraine organizations to help um, send those supplies to Ukraine. Amazing. Yes, just. Um, I wanted to talk about how I found my topic. So it began through an internship. I'm pretty sure I, I worked with you last year yeah. and went creating these lesson plans. And um, I just found this topic interesting when I was like looking through the book because food security, you know, I haven't heard, heard about it a lot prior to my research on um, when I was researching it and I kind of find it difficult to find some information and today's youth don't really know about it. And um, so that's why I try to pursue this topic. And I also wanted to mention, I forgot to mention that I went to, uh, what high school I go to, I go to Bergen County Academies in uh, New Jersey. And in my school, there are many clubs that um, actually are activists in supporting climate change and, uh, you know, Usually weekly, they they uh, rally outside legislation halls and you know speak about how it's imperative to uh, really start changing now. So yeah, that's what I want to mention. Thank you, Chris. Yes, William. I guess I can also talk about how how I chose my topic. It's like I think it's uh, it's similar to Chris in that I was working on a project over summer that I was dealing with basically urban tourism between like South Korea and New York during the age of COVID. So I was, I, so when I was thinking about projects I could work on for this, I was thinking back to myself like past projects and I thought about that. I was like, this sounds really interesting if I can focus on something like tourism uh, on disaster preparedness, it was just how I started. I came up with like these tourist places and landmarks that came up and something from my school is, I think also similar to Chris is that we also have clubs. It's uh we have a really big called club called like P uh Phillips Academy Sustainability Coalition. Basically, it's like students meet up every week, talking about what they can do, what they can promote, and they basically uh work with some of the faculty members here to to work on a lot of different projects from like gardening 
like promoting Earth Week, educating people, having like speakers come in and talk about like um, climate change and stuff like that. That is very, very amazing to know that the school is taking all this initiative and it's great to know that it's in New Jersey. That's fantastic. Uh, anything else that you want to add? I just wanted to mention that this topic that you've taken, disaster preparedness, in, in so many different lenses, I think is really an eye-opener for me because usually for me it's like, you know, only one aspect or only two, you know, few things, but you have really broadened the horizon of taking this disaster, uh, you know, linkages to the pandemic, to the role of libraries, to monuments and all the things that we need to work on. And uh, just to mention that I think this is the future of sustainability because um, also just to give you an example that um, at the Earth Institute at Columbia University, uh, we formed a disaster preparedness network and this network consists of people from various different you know streams various different schools um, even um, music schools even you know other very art and then uh, data scientists are there climate scientists are there I am uh, from the education side international education so I am a part of it a disaster preparedness experts obviously are a part of it. So I think this is going to really, what you are doing in terms of your research will be mainstream uh, in the next you know, couple of years, or maybe I would say in the next five years or so. So we are collaborating interdisciplinary collaborations. We are forming, we are forming intersectional you know, thinking so that we can look at this disaster preparedness in different ways and you are already you know, working on this in this direction. So I really commend you for taking the, you know, even the housing, uh, the economic side of things. I think definitely there is something uh, that you have, uh, you know, you are thinking in the right direction and uh, continue to work on, you know, this area because much needs to be done and a lot of different disciplines need to come together. So I am learning from my colleagues who are disaster preparedness experts, uh, there are people who are learning from you know each other on various different aspects and much you know we need to cover a lot of ground and their disasters as you know are really increasing their intensity and so many uh, disasters hit every country uh, these days so i think we really need to ramp up our learning learn from every aspect learn from each other form teams uh, that's what we are doing at the university level, forming teams and working together on this uh, particular concept. And I think you are already, you know, experts in your areas of research. You've done the background work, uh, maybe work together and see what you can come up collaboratively. And next year, when we do these huge symposium, maybe you can do a phase two of uh, where you left this research and where you are. And I would really hope that, you know, you continue on this uh, path of learning and also congratulations to Marjabeen and Sue who have been uh, guiding you in the right direction. Of course, it is your research and your ideas and what a wonderful moderator. I think uh, Yoon Sung, you did a fabulous job of getting all the ideas together and connecting all of them. Uh, so congratulations to all. Um, any last reflections from Marjabeen and Sue? Radhika, thank you so much. I would uh, just second what what you said. Um, I, you know, from my uh, vantage point, I I saw how much uh, work and effort um, all of these folks uh, put in, and you know, I'd I'd really like to appreciate and and thank all of them. And Radhika, to to your point, you know, I uh, at the age that they are at right now, I was unaware of so much. And so I'm really, really heartened to know that, you know, young people who are going to be leaders of the future, um, you know, they they are so insightful. They are thinking about these things way before my my generation did. So, you know, it's it's not just um, an absolute pleasure working with them. It's it's also you know, it gives me hope <laughs> for the for the future. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks again. 
I just want to piggyback on what Maja Venus just said. I'm really impressed with everyone's work. And um, thank you, Radhika, for suggesting the topic for our panel. Um, and for and you know, I really appreciate um, how you like left it open ended for us. And um, and all credits to Maja Bean for making it so creative, um, a very creative panel um, that all connects to the one theme, but in so many different levels. Uh, I know some of our students are interested in urban studies, some of them are interested in environmental studies, some of them are interested in architecture, design. So um, I think really Maja Bean came up with all these ideas on how to bring this together as a panel and I really want to give her credit on that um and you know just um like you said Radhika disaster is happening at so many different levels and so many different ways and I'm so glad that these students touched on so many different and diverse topics and um I think the fact that you know these are things that are really happening in our real life um students are more interested in these topics and i thank you for giving us a platform to discuss these issues and um, i i know a lot of our students right now are still in their preliminary phases and their research so i think they would you know um, would love the opportunity to get back to you with their follow-up projects in the summer um so again, I really thank you for giving us this, you know, platform to really discuss these issues with you. It is completely my honor, Sue, and so amazing to be in this uh, esteemed uh, group. I will definitely share the video with our uh, students in India and uh, elsewhere as well as they will be very interested in knowing about this topic because it is such a pertinent topic in every country. And I hope they'll be able to gain some, uh, you know, ideas and implement it in India and see maybe later on we can come back together as a combined panel to see what uh, uh, have they taken up and maybe you would have progressed with your research uh, going forward. So maybe that could be our approach uh, next time, but uh, very happy to be hosting this panel. And, uh, Amazing. Thank you, Sue, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and thank you again. And it's late at night and very early for Majabin. So we will talk <laughs> today. And uh, I think I'll definitely share the video with the rest uh, and keep you updated with uh, their end as well. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for keeping it on time. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.